Hey guys, welcome to the new episode of the Andy Social Podcast. And once you're done here, make sure to head over to Goat King Riders Club. Where we never let grammar get in the way of a good story. Good yarn. Yarn, story. Yeah. Fuck, doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it does when we're doing the promo for it. Oh well, that's what they're getting. <laughs> uh, also, come and check us out on uh, YouTube for full video versions. Enjoy yeah. this show. You're back. Welcome to the Andy Social Podcast. And uh, you know what I'm going to say. Before we kick into this week's episode, come and join me on Patreon, patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. It's a great way to support this podcast and support starts from only a buck a month. If you want to pay a little bit more, you get access to an exclusive Patreon podcast that comes out every Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. Lots of fun, lots of dumb stuff. And um, it just it's a massive uh, way to contribute to the uh, the reoccurring costs of running a podcast, uh, hosting and editing gear, et cetera, et cetera. And the more that, uh, you guys get behind and support it, uh, the less stress I'm going to have of having a podcast that costs money. And, uh, it makes me focus on just getting really, really cool, exciting, fun people on the podcast to share these great stories with you all. So consider it patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. Would love to have you there. Flick me a message and say, hello. Hey, welcome to the Andy Social Podcast, episode 258. And that's right, you've got two episodes in one week. Get ready, this is permanent. Every week, moving forward, we're going to have two episodes of the Andy Social Podcast. Mondays, we're going to have a brand new guest, somebody from a different background. It could be music, it could be comedy, it could be sports, it could be science, it could be the arts, it could be whatever. Whoever I find interesting will be Monday morning, 6 a.m. Sydney time, and every Wednesday, 6 a.m. Sydney time. I'm going to have either a return guest or an Australian musician on the podcast. I really want to highlight uh, Australian musicians and Australian music uh, without making this a completely uh, soul music podcast. So uh, this is the best of both worlds. So here we go. Episode 258, kicking off 2021 with Tim Pope. Tim is from the Amenta. They've got a brand new album coming out called Revelator on the 19th of February, and uh, we've had a great chat. It's, uh, we've, ha- we've had a great chat. Go and listen to it. Uh, I'm going to have links to uh, the pre-order uh, stuff for Revelator, so you can go and uh, pre-order the album. Uh, the video clip for Sea of Money is there, so check that out. Uh, an amazing band. They've been around for a long time. This is yeah a really great chat with Tim, and I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. So uh, enough crapping on from me. Please enjoy this great chat with Tim Pope. Welcome back to the Australian heavy metal scene, by the way. Hey, thank you very much. Yeah, it's good to be back. <laughs> it, it seems like, I mean, I'm sure you'll be able to fill me in on, on the uh, reality behind the scenes of it all, but it kind of feels really weird, but also fitting that you guys have sort of made this, and I mean, it's, it's such a cheap term to use, but this comeback during a year where a lot of other bands are just shutting down and just, you know, just packing up shop for the time being and just going behind the scenes and just uh, keeping quiet. But you guys have started to reawaken and and obviously got the the new album coming out soon. Yeah. I I wish it was uh, planned and I thought, I wish it was all very clever, but it was just, uh, just a timing thing. We've been working on this for years actually, since we, um, you know, we went into hiatus and we pretty much only, only maybe a few months after that, we started working on what eventually became this album. So it was like, um, it's all just the fact that it was ready, and then all, we're like, "Oh, this would be great. We can we can tour and do all that sort of stuff." And then, uh, you know, this all happened. So it's kind of kind of interesting time to do it. Yeah, it was just it was. I think when I saw, I don't know. I mean, you'll be able to fill me in because one of the things I was going to ask you is about sort of reawakening the ba- reawakening the band, and also sort of you know becoming interactive on social media, and sort of it seemed like there's a bit of sort of early planting the seeds and saying, "Hey, we're." we're awake here, we're alive and sort of getting yeah. some music back out there, the back catalog, you know, refreshing people's uh, memories of the band. But, um, when I, when I saw it all happening, I thought, oh, it seems, it just seems so strategic, especially this time of year. It's almost <laughs> like the guys have gone, you know what, this is the time to strike. Let's, let's do it now. It just seemed really fitting, especially with like the first single coming out and everything like that. But, um, but, uh, not quite. Yeah, it was, I mean, there was a little bit of strategy there. One of them was that, um, We'd, we'd had this sort of the Facebook page at one point was pretty active, but we hadn't posted anything, I think, in five years or something like yeah. that. And so it was kind of like, well, we don't know if this is still a, a functional thing. You know, I don't know how the algorithms will work. Maybe we're going to post it. It's just going to disappear. So there was a bit of just sort of 
start moving and see what happens. Also to see, you know, it's been so long, does anyone actually still care? <laughs> Thankfully, there's there's like the five or five or six rusted on Amenta fans who were were pretty excited. So I was like, okay, this will be all right. And then it was we just wanted to get a little bit of buzz so that when we went out and approached labels and things, they they could see that there was some some interest and some excitement. Did you do a lot of shopping? Did it take take a while to sort of lock something in? Uh, quite quick to find the right label, but we we did send out to a couple. So we had um, we were our previous three albums were all with listable records mm. and. Uh, they they were really good and we really liked them, um, but we were out of contract with them, and so we thought, okay, well, we'll they're potentially there. They'd expressed interest in the album, um, and so we thought, well, we'll just go out and see if there's anything else because we had sort of in our minds that the previous three albums were kind of a trilogy of what the band was, and this was going to be a kind of a start to a new part of the band. So there was a part of it, a part of us sort of thinking maybe we'll try and find a different partner and try something different rather than kind of continuing where we were. Um, so we sent out to a, a bunch of labels, um, and one of them, one of the ones that was right up the top of our shortlist was, um, DMP or, um, I'm going to fuck this up and I try and say it, but Deborah Muir Morty, uh, Productions. That's, that's better um, than me. I saw that written down, but there's no way I'm going to try and pronounce that. <laughs> I think every other interview I've done, I've just gone, <laughs> and uh, just hope that, hope that it's clear. <laughs> We um we we really liked them, you know. They'd done uh, they'd just done amazing work with Ulcerate, um, mm. and they they've obviously bands like Blood or Snored, um, Mains, who I'm a really big fan of, uh, and th- things like Mains they had that were quite odd. So Mains obviously come from a black metal background, but they now they do almost this kind of um, electronic pop thing, which was quite interesting. So the fact that they had bands like that was really interesting to us. Um, so they were quite high up on our on our short list and. We sent out. Uh, we made a an EV, uh, EVP. God, that's the other label. Uh, <laughs> we made a. We made sort of a nice um, website for the album. Put it behind a password and sent it out to labels. And um, DMP came back, you know, really, really quickly, and they were really, really keen. Um, and we, you know, asked around and also to speak really highly of them. Uh, Ruins, who are obviously mm-hmm. Dave, uh, our drummer, plays Ruins. They they've released some albums through DMP, so it, they get uh, such a good rap. And and in our time. So far, working with them, it's been amazing. They're they're a great partner. It's um, it's a bit of a bit of a success success story after after so many years, sort of at least from the outside looking in, uh, having the band in limbo and sort of not doing a lot. Because I've one thing that I noticed when you guys announced the album is I just had this sense of relief in the back of my mind as a as a musician or an Australian metal musician or whatever whatever the term's going to be the label because. You know, for us, the last album we put out, there was a, well, there was a six year gap between studio albums, but we did a bunch of stuff in between, but yeah. even like the last album came out last year and the way that the world works these days with music, I mean, within a month or two, it's just old news. And so I'm sitting back going, all right, what are we going to do next? What are we going to do next? But when you guys sort of came back to life and, you know, announced this album, I sort of just looked at it and thought, it doesn't matter how how long it is between releases it, it it doesn't matter because you can come back at any any time and 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 sort of almost pick up where you left off um was it yeah was there sort of i mean when you guys wrapped up the the last album i mean was there sort of an inkling in the back of your minds that you know there might be a, a long gap between the next time you guys put anything out or was it just it just happened the way it did i think it was there, there was a couple of factors that played into it one of them um, I'm going to talk up because it's me and I don't know if this actually matters to the other guys in the band, but I'd like to imagine it does. Uh, I'd actually, the band stopped playing live in 2014. I actually hadn't played live since 2011. Mm. Um, so the band was kind of touring, uh, without me for, for a number of years. Uh, cause I kept having kids inconveniently in the middle of tours and things. <laughs> <laughs> so I, for me, you know, the, the live aspect of it wasn't a big, part of it for me anymore it was all about writing the music and recording uh but the other guys were out there touring and they were you know we were, we were touring off this album it was it did reasonably well um but we were kind of in that level where i mean you know anywhere you're touring and it's not really paying for itself it's just you're not in that next level where people start paying you enough to actually do this properly mm. so it's kind of you, you're kind of still feeding in feeding in and it's, it gets after all it's a little bit heartbreaking so we, we could do all right in Australia, but as soon as you go up to, to um, the US in particular, that's a really hard country to tour without the money. Um, so it just, I think we all got burnt out and it, 
felt like, well, we've been doing it kind of half assed for a little while. Not half assed, but you know, half the band. Uh, so let's let's just back off for a bit. But the the main reason was we we'd done those three albums and they felt like that that trilogy and that sort of encapsulation of what the band was. That sort of really, I guess, I don't want to use the term underground, but I guess that more sort of really extreme, really brutal kind of stuff. We're like, that's that's those three albums. And if we go and do that again and just churn out another album to keep the whole grind going, it would have just felt, it would have felt false. Mm. It would have just felt like we're just doing it for that reason. And it, when you look at our, our past albums, they've, they've always been a big gap because I think we always take the time afterwards to, to recharge and try and find a new direction and try and find something that's inspiring. We've never been people who just sort of churn out songs and go, all right, Here's, a, here's the next 12 songs, here's an album. It's just not ever been that way for us, I don't think. So coming out of this album, it wasn't – initially I don't think we we had it in the back of our mind we were recording, but I think pretty quickly after it was released and we started touring and we started looking at writing new music, it felt like, oh, I think we might need to uh, pull back here a bit and just kind of get some of the magic back. And uh, it uh, unfortunately took seven years or eight years. <laughs> Did, was there any – was there any tension between you guys at any stage over that period of time where, I mean, it would be different for, for Dave, I think, out of everybody in the band. Like, Dave's just always doing something and he's he's in a yeah. million different bands. But between you guys, was there, was there tension or, or any pressure that you felt or placed on each other because, you know, the time was sort of, you know, getting longer and longer between the last time you guys did anything or put anything out? Because one thing that I've, I mean, I've felt this a lot over the years, but I know a lot of yeah. other musicians are the same. You sort of, when you got a lot of friends that are that are out there playing music and releasing music, and you sort of always you're always watching to see what everybody else is doing, and so you start to go, "Well, fuck now, what am I doing? Like, we need to be yeah. doing something." And so you feel that pressure and that stress to go, "Oh, like let's let's kick into gear." Was there were there moments of that over the years in between? Oh, uh, there was definitely um, definitely professional jealousy out there, especially as you say, Dave. <laughs> in a lot of bands. Yeah. Uh, we used to always joke when we first started out, and Dave joined the band. Psychoptic were. At that stage, bigger than us, but the um, the differential wasn't that great, and we used to talk about how we were going to destroy them. <laughs> and then, uh, not too long after that, the differential grew substantially. <laughs> so uh, we never quite caught them. But there, so there was a lot of the sort of looking at and going, yeah, that that's awesome. You know, we'd we'd love to be out there doing that. But internally, I don't think there was there was no tension as such. Um, Eric and I, uh, pretty much throughout all that, we were getting together regularly and writing and recording. So for us, it felt like. We were still working really, really hard. Um, Kane, um, here's our vocalist over in Perth. Um, I think he found it a little bit hard because he's he's very much a live animal. Mm. Um, he loves playing live, loves touring, all that sort of stuff. So I know he found that hard, and he could have was always sort of you know suggesting we do things. And but we we'd taken a bit of that external pressure off by telling everyone we were going on hiatus, even though you know we we never broke up the band or anything like that. We were, we weren't necessarily going to continue writing as the Amenta, but um, we'd sort of taken that pressure off. So no one was watching us to see what we'd do next. So we could kind of take our time. And that, I guess, was a blessing and a curse. In some ways, you kind of need that external pressure um, to say, hey, you've got to, got to release an album. You've promised to a label that you're going to have an album ready. And that kind of forces you to get stuff done. But we kind of took that pressure off. So we kind of expanded into that gap and just spent a lot of time experimenting and playing around with things. So for us, it was still really active. It's quite strange. It seems like you know, there's that analogy of the duck in a pond where its legs are underneath making all the move. <laughs> yeah. It was a bit like that. You know, no one no one knew what we were doing. We didn't really talk about it with anyone. I mean, it wasn't a secret, but we didn't really discuss it. Um, no one really cared enough to ask. So we just kind of kept kept doing what we do and, and, and writing music. We wrote actually a bunch of stuff, uh, only only which probably half of it ended up being the Amenta songs. Uh, so it was a really busy time for us. It was kind of cool, but it was, was a bit strange to look out and see all these bands doing these great things and there were so many great albums released in that time and you know it was uh it was an interesting period yeah i guess it's kind of good in a way that you know if you're if you guys are sitting down and getting together often and you know putting music together and writing and all that sort of stuff it kind of keeps you stimulated throughout that period so you you're you're distracted in a, in a good way where you're sort of working, you know, tinkering away behind the scenes and that's more than enough to sort of keep you satisfied without sort of getting too restless about it all. And maybe, maybe just what you said before with Kane, you know, came more of a, you know, somebody who really sort of relishes in that live setting might've been a different yeah. story for him and different feelings. But I guess from on your side of the fence, you know, and especially not playing live for so many years as well, 
you probably don't, yeah. you didn't have that itch that you needed to scratch. It wasn't a big priority to sort of get out there and sort of be, be in the public eye as such. It was just more of a case of, you know, just enjoying that process of creating. Yeah. And it was exactly that. It was just sort of, it was actually a really pleasant time uh, to, to just sort of do it without any of that pressure and, and not even knowing what it was going to be. Just sort of uh, some of the songs we, we wrote uh, probably will never see the light of day, but they were really different and really odd. And for us, they were sort of a really um, new direction for us to kind of write in. So that was really interesting and inspiring for us. And I don't know if we would have done that if we would had a bit more pressure on us. So I think the album that came out of that would have been very different. But I think with with Kane, the great thing about Kane is he's he's such a uh, he's he's, an, he's a phenomenal live musician and he loves playing live. But he's also got this great uh, artistic sensibility. So when it came into doing things like film clips and artwork and all that sort of stuff, that's where he really nails that sort of stuff. So the, the coolest thing about this album for me was that it's probably the most collaborative uh, we've been. It used to just be Eric and I writing everything that we'd pretty much dictate how it went. Uh, but ever since Kane's joined the band, it's time he's become this equal creative partner. So it's it's we're now a lot stronger in that sense, which is really, really cool. And once again, I don't know if that would have happened if we hadn't had that time to kind of learn how everyone works and kind of go through that, um, you know, steep learning curve of how to talk to people without pissing them off. <laughs> was was the was the album finished before all the COVID stuff hit? Yeah, it's it was. I think it was actually. Um, the writing, it was completely written uh, by the end of 2018, I think, hmm. uh, and then recorded in, I think we finished recording in, I'm going to say October 2019. Right, okay. So, yeah, so it's, it's been done for a while, and then there was the kind of the shopping for labels, and we did, um, you know, the artwork and all that sort of stuff, which we hadn't been doing at the time, uh, at the same time, so we kind of had to do all that at the end. So it's actually been finished for quite a while. So it's quite strange that we've been listening to this album for so long and no one's actually heard it. So every time I, I speak to someone about the album, I keep forgetting that no one's heard stuff and I start talking about songs and no one has any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> In your mind, it's all old news. It's like, oh man, this is this is uh, this is this is a relic now. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. very strange. With um, with the video clip, uh, how did that? What was the logistics behind that? Was that something that was filmed? quite some time ago or was that more of a recent thing that you guys tried to put together during sort of the last several months? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a lockdown video. So that was actually cool. done um, entirely in Perth. So it was all done by Kane with a friend of his called Garth Hurley. Um, and they, uh, we'd kind of said, we need a film clip. We told the label there was going to be one. Uh, we'd set the date that the song was going to be released. So we had a, a kind of an end time. The process, I think, took a while so uh, it was probably about a six month process of first shot to final edit but not uh working the time it was kind of finding the places where they could record and get things done so i think perth was lucky that they weren't as badly hit so they didn't have um as many restrictions but a lot of the person that we we'd done some film clips with before that kane had worked with um she wasn't too keen uh, understandably about going out and filming around people mm. so we had to look at um some other techniques but over that time Kane and Garth had filmed, uh, I don't know if you saw the trailer that came out beforehand, but that yeah. that whole sort of set was all done um, in Kane's neighbourhood during lockdown. So he's kind of sneaking out in his dressing gown, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> so this one, he, he then pulled together these massive um, crews and casts of people who were willing to, willing to do it. Got a whole bunch of uh, ballet students, made prosthetic masks. You know, it's a, it's a massive undertaking, but he did it all. Uh, without our help, really, we kind of we didn't actually see any of the footage until uh, the final edit, which was quite strange. So we all kind of kept saying, "Hey, we've got to see something, got to see something." And he kept explaining what was happening, and it sounded amazing, <laughs> but we hadn't seen it. And then he said, "All right, here it is." And it's like, "Oh shit, that's fucking awesome!" So w I guess that the vision or the creative vision of of the video clip itself was there was that a collaborative thing between all of you? You sort of said like this is kind of the vibe that we're going for. This is kind of the look that we're going for, or was a lot of this sort of Kane's domain where he was sort of given a bit of uh, a bit of creative freedom to try and put something together? We we definitely left it it reasonably open to Kane. The only thing we did uh, really early on is Kane told us about some ideas that he had. And we workshopped a couple of things, but generally it was all Kane and, and Garth. And one of the, the big things about the, the lyrics of the album is they're kind of written to be interpreted. So they're not, um, they're, 
the way I imagine them is they're kind of uh, like like in a, in a piece of modern abstract art mm. where you have not necessarily it's not about something. It's a whole bunch of images that juxtapose and try and give you a kind of feeling, a kind of and you 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 create the meaning in your mind. There's not necessarily a meaning coming from the painting. It's something that's happening internally, and so. I was. I wrote the lyrics, and I was talking to Kane about it, and I, we we discussed very, very sort of uh, surface level what the lyrics were about. But uh, we were kind of more interested in Kane's interpretation of the lyrics rather than my interpretation of the lyrics, because that adds kind of that second layer of meaning. And the more interpretation you have of it, the the, the more that uh, the power of the kind of the abstract nature of the lyrics kind of grows. So we just let him do pretty much what he wanted, and. We have enough trust in Kane's aesthetic um, taste that we knew it was going to be something, you know, creepy and and really effective. He's sort of really strong on that score, so we're quite happy to just let him do what he needed to do. Oh, fucking earth is creepy! <laughs> it's such a creepy <laughs> clip. I mean, it's 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 it was really it was in a in a positive way. It was a very shocking clip, and I think mm. it sort of, and especially with the music as well, it sort of added this extra layer of surprise to the whole package because yeah musically it just doesn't sound like anything you guys have done in the past it's got elements and it's it's got a bit of that vibe but there's just it's just a, i mean as you said before like those those first few albums were sort of you know a chapter of the band and now this is a new chapter but um yeah when like for my years listening to it, i go oh my god like i just was not expecting this at all and so that with that visual aspect i mean just so much you know it was just so stimulating to be able to sort of sit down and watch it and go, Oh shit, this is uh this is next level. They're back. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm glad it had that effect. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I definitely think um, we, when we were listening to the album, that was always going to be the first release song. Cause it's so, it's so immediate and it, it is really different to anything we've done, but it's still kind of dark and nasty, but it was sort of, I think that that film clip came when we saw the film clip and saw it all together, it just all of a sudden it made even more sense. It was kind of, it's cool to be able to do that and come back and, and hopefully surprise people. Cause it would, I think if you've been gone that long and you come back and it's like, Hey, remember us, here's that, here's another song we wrote and it's all kind of the same stuff. It's kind of, it's a bit boring. Mm. You want, you want that element of surprise and that, I guess the element of shock without it being kind of like a Marilyn Manson shock rocker thing, but you want to have that, um, that frisson of excitement and you go, what the hell is this? And I love bands that uh, the first time you hear a new song from a new album, you're like, oh, I don't know if I like it. I don't know if I like it. I'm interested in it, but I don't know if I like it. And then you listen to it and you grow, you grow with it. And then by the end of it, it's your favorite thing. That's kind of uh, not something we deliberately set out to do, but it's definitely something that we're kind of aware of. I guess you kind of want people to, what's the best way of describing it? You, you want people to sort of learn the music as it goes, like I think sometimes, like I know, I know there's been a lot of albums that I'll listen to first go and I'll go, oh, this is amazing. It sounds so good and it's so catchy yeah. and hooky. And then it just doesn't have the shelf life because it's yeah. so, I guess it's, I shouldn't say one dimensional, but it's just very, it doesn't have a lot of depth to it. And there's not a lot to be paying attention to or learning. And I think those, as you said, like those albums where you sort of, you hear a song and you go, there's something here, like there's something I, I like about it, but I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around what I'm actually listening to. And uh, they're the ones that sort of, you know, it, you grow, you grow to enjoy it and really appreciate it. And it takes, it takes many listens to, to really sort of, uh, you know, uh, absorb it and, and enjoy it. It's kind of like the, yeah, it's kind of like when you're, when you're a kid and you're buying an album and you've only got a few bucks to spend and you're forced to have to, to listen to that album and you go, Oh, it's, I don't know if it's really clicking with me, but then you, you know, I've just spent 30 bucks on a CD or a vinyl or whatever. So I'm going to sit down and, and, uh, yep. and make the most of it. And, and those albums are usually the ones that stay. Yeah. Yeah. I actually was only thinking the other day about one of my early metalhead memories when I used to go to the, the you remember the Hammer House in uh, Parramatta? No, I don't. So, you, you might be, you might be a bit older than me. Uh, it was um, it was a, uh, it was a great. It was kind of like the Australian or the Sydney equivalent of you know the Helvet in um, in Norway. It was oh, their right. sort of the centre of death and black metal in at least the western suburbs of Sydney. And so we used to go. I was you know still in high school at the time. Save up the money and go there, and you'd you know probably only be able to buy one album. But I remember buying an album by a, a band called Abruptum, who. Um, I'd heard one track on a comp and it was the best black metal song I'd ever heard. I was like, this is the creepiest, oddest thing. It was a really strange. And I thought this album's going to be the best. And it was a black digipack and had an embossed cover, which I'd never seen before. And I was thinking, this is the best thing ever. 
didn't have a discman at the time, so I had to catch the train all the way back. So this was in Parramatta. I had to go back to Hornsby. <laughs> and I'd spent, you know, probably 35 bucks on it because it was an import. And I got home and I put it on. It was like, oh, it's one track that goes for 60 minutes. <laughs> Sitting there with my mate going, okay, that's that's interesting. And then started listening and it's just feedback and people screaming. And I'm going, okay, well, that's that's just an intro. Listen to that for about five minutes and it's still going. And it was 60 minutes of that. <laughs> and I swear, because I spent 35 bucks on that, I listened to that every day for about six months. <laughs> I was <laughs> determined to find it. <laughs> I'm going to appreciate this 60-minute scream. Just to yeah. <laughs> mark my words. <laughs> Oh, that, I mean, yeah, there's been so many, so many uh, examples of that over the years where, yeah, you've just, you've invested so much and, and also just a bit of saving face for yourself. It's just like, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm, I'm in a sense of denial here. I don't want to convince myself I've made the wrong decision here. I'm going to, exactly. yeah, I'm, I'm going to be determined. I'm going to really uh, buckle down here and, uh, and see if I can, uh, see if I can make it work. Uh, but yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. but um Man, like uh, that's yeah, sixty minutes of uh, of screaming. That's um, <laughs> yeah. I came to appreciate it slightly more. I don't think I ever loved it. <laughs> it was a pretty old style album. There's a bunch of, I mean, uh, sort of me growing up in Brisbane as a teenager in sort of early twenties before it came to Sydney. I yeah. went to a lot of a uh, lot of local gigs up in up in Brisbane. So it was all sort of, and most of, most of the scene up there was all death and black metal. So I sort yeah. of got well and truly used to some of the more monotonous sort of uh, repetitive black metal riffs and stuff where you just stand there and you've got a beer and you just, your head's just like slowly bopping going, oh, oh, oh God. And, um, but um, actually buying some of this stuff and having it at home, I think there's this, I think this is why certain people really, uh, really embrace like black metal in particular, where it's got that repetitive uh, sort of, it's almost like a meditative sort of um, yeah. feeling to it, where you can play the same riff over and over again for twenty minutes, and and it's okay. It sort of it builds the ambience of of the song. Yeah, it's interesting though. I think that that sort of stuff, and one of the reasons why I guess playing live isn't as big thing for me is things like that. I find tend to work more in a controlled listening environment, especially with headphones and things like that. Because when you're standing at a gig watching that with a beer, and your mate's yelling in your ear about you want to go for a cigarette or whatever, it's it's a very different experience. So you're seeing that sort of stuff, which I think is probably is quite um, it's it's mind focused as, a, as opposed to body focused. It's just not the right place for it. So it's a strange thing. And I think that with with our band, I've always heard our songs in the way we kind of write and record them in the studio. And when you go out and play them, play them in a live setting, you, obviously you miss all that subtlety. And it took a long time for me to kind of justify doing it and saying hey this is this is the way it's going to sound it's going to be a, a different thing it's going to be a lot more feral and chaotic but it's not going to be the album thing so i think you get those black metal albums they're brilliant in one setting and in, in other settings they just don't work they don't have that magic it's quite strange have you i mean although the band's quite different these days and it's been a long time since the band's played any shows when when you guys have been sort of piecing together the album and writing it was there was there any considerations of you know these songs having to be played live at some point in time in in the future, whether it be years years down the track, or is it more of a case of like live something you worry about later on? And you just want to make something that's going to actually work as it is. Yeah, that's that's pretty much how we've always worked is is just making a song, however it has to happen, and then worry about the live later. I always imagine it is almost like it's almost sculptural the way we build music, so it's kind of you're adding things and, and you're kind of building this structure however you need to do it. So it's like a mixed media thing where, you know, we'll, we'll use this instrument, we'll use that instrument, it all kind of, it might not be able to be something we can do in reality, but it's kind of something we build in time as opposed to, you know, you can record a band in a rehearsal room and you get a lot of live energy and it's more like a photograph as opposed to a sculpture. It's kind of here is a document of a thing that happened, whereas we're looking at here is something we're imagining and we're going to try and make it happen. So it's sort of, not the live aspect doesn't really come into it, but I do know when we were we were quite a fair way into these songs, there was a lot of talk about holy shit, this one's going to be a belt alive, this one's going to work really, really well. So that it's there and it's it's in the back of our minds. But uh, especially for my stuff, because I do all the the samples and keyboards and things like that, I don't um, I don't generally sit there with an instrument and play parts. It's more I'm going to you know bash this metal tin and run run it through some effects and see what it sounds like. So. 
my parts are not necessarily something that I can uh, directly replicate live. So my, what I'm now thinking about, because we are intending to play live when when we can um, safely in this country, uh, I'm, I'm kind of thinking up ways that I can do, which I, I've never done before. In the past, I've kind of sampled things that I've done. So I've, I've made these stupid sounds uh, and then I just go and sample them and I trigger them from a keyboard. But this time I'm thinking I'm, I want to experiment with different ways of doing it. So having maybe some guitar pedals and some sound sources that I can actually play with in real time and, and be a little bit it'll be a little bit more chaotic and it won't sound like the album but it'll be a little bit more live and exciting and dangerous i think dangerous in the sense that it could not uh, work with with the live stuff just and just given what you mentioned there do you do you see live shows for the Amenta being more of a uh, what's the, what's what's the right word? A bit more of a spectacle in the sense that it's not just. I mean, just the way that. I mean, even the role that you play in the band, it just doesn't make sense that you would just get the guys up on stage. You just turn everything on. You just play a set as per normal. It's, it almost seems like you've got to create a, an atmosphere and and you know it, it has to be more of a, an experience rather than it just being sort of a one dimensional. So, well, I shouldn't say one dimensional because I'm just slagging off every every band that plays live now. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one thing that I've I've spoken to a lot of guys about is, especially now, like, you know, as we, well, I don't know, up until up until a few weeks ago, I was pretty optimistic about uh, getting back out and playing mm-hmm. live shows again. It's a different yeah. story. <laughs> even even today, it's, it's like, oh, man. But, um, but a conversation I've had with a lot of people is that you can't just, you can't just get up on stage and just play. I mean, you can, yep. and it depends on the style of music. It, it you know, every, every style of music will... Will will uh, you know come with it with with whatever the requirements are? But I think with a lot of bands, you've got to really put more in to create an experience for people and to make people excited to come back out and and see you know live music, live entertainment, or whatever it is. Is that something in in the back of your mind where you want it to be more than just a plug and play sort of scenario? Yeah, I think for us it always has to be because I was only thinking about this the other day. I think part of part of it is obviously you want to give a great show and people want to come back. You want to, people to come back and you want them to talk about the show. But the other side of it is there's a kind of an element of self belief that has to go into it. So there's there's certain kinds of music um, that you can get up and plug and play, and it's that's part of the authenticity of it. Mm. And so you're as the artist, you could be on stage and you can believe what you're doing because. So for example, if you're a singer songwriter with an acoustic guitar, the more uh, no frills it is, the more authentic it's authentic it's perceived to be not only by the audience but by you performing you can feel like you're embodying the songs we've got a similar sort of thing where we're making this really aggressive um in some ways kind of violent music and to get up and and just perform that in our board shorts would would be a kind of almost an injustice to the music but i would i would feel foolish because you're creating this angry music while looking like you're going down the shops to get milk it just it doesn't work for me I need to almost um, embody a character in, in some sort of ways to make it feel like I'm not up there pantomiming, which is bizarre because we're, we're all dressed up in, in costumes and things. You'd think that would be the pantomime, but I think that's necessary to, to make it feel real. And I think that's true with a lot of, a lot of uh, particularly black metal and, and a lot of extreme metal is that it flies really, really close to the border of uh, being ridiculous and maybe it, maybe it steps over that border. But if you can bring it back with a kind of self belief, you can actually kind of turn it into something that's a little bit transcendent. But by, by sort of treading that line, where just before it becomes over the top, and if you can really, really in the moment believe in it, then it actually becomes something really, really special. And for us as performers, that's when you when you nail that line. That's when it actually feels like you come off stage and go, "Holy shit, that was that was an experience. That was cool." And that doesn't happen, as you know, it doesn't happen with every gig. Sometimes you go out there and you're just not feeling it. And you get off and go, you know, that was fun. We played well or whatever, but it just didn't have the thing. But sometimes you get off and, and it's you like it's like you're high or drunk. You just come off and you're like, holy shit, we nailed it. That was the best. And that's that's kind of what we're aiming for each time. Do you think there's a fine line between sort of nailing it and maybe taking it too far or, or not the interpretation of what you guys are trying to do or the, or the translation of that language of you guys putting out something with a particular intention Versus what you actually what's received by the audience, do you think there's a really fine line there? It's it's like a carefully careful sort of juggling act. Oh, definitely, and it, and it all comes down to I think if you believe it, if you go too far and you're acting it, then you're not believing it, and if you don't go far enough, then you're 
then you're kind of standing behind an image. So you have to be right at that level, right at that line, and it is absolutely fine. You can one one kind of false move, and it is ridiculous. You know, you, you're watching some guys up there in face paint and contact lenses, but if you can if you can nail that moment, it it becomes something else. It's something cool. I um. I, I don't know if you'll agree, but uh, one band that just comes to mind almost instantly uh, and who does it really well, in my opinion, is Portal. And yeah. for years, I remember going to shows and, you know, you play a tiny little hole in the wall, whatever, in Brisbane, and out comes this imposing figure with a clock on, on as a head. And you just yeah. go, what the fuck is this? Especially the first time I ever saw Portal, because I saw them first before I actually heard them. So I didn't even know who they were. And... I guess if you're trying to, if I was trying to describe them to somebody else who didn't know anything about metal or didn't know anything about them, and I just described them, you know, just using words, it would probably sound like the most ridiculous, the dumbest thing you could possibly think of. Uh, yeah. But the way that they hold themselves and the way that they portray themselves and the conviction behind what they do on stage, it's the most imposing experience and you stand there and it's intimidating and and then of, of course like just the the assault that comes out of that band is yeah. just it's next level but i think that's, it it's just something where i guess you could have another band that could that could have the same visual aspect and may not have that conviction there behind what they're doing and it could come off just completely missing the mark and just seem seeming like almost spinal tapish in the way that uh the way that they're sort of putting themselves out there, but um, they just they've they've got some secret sauce in there, and I think I, I don't know I don't know the guys that well. I know I know Shane, but um, yeah. I think there's there's a there's a different there's a different way of thinking in that band, and it it lends to to an advantage for them. Uh, but uh, yeah. that's that's definitely a band I think of when when sort of creating an experience when they play. Yeah, I think they're they're the perfect example, and you're right. It's entirely about conviction. You've got to have that. It's like a conviction in yourself and what you're doing, and knowing that, knowing that it's right. And if you can, if you can do that on stage like they do, you're right. It's it's just a phenomenal experience. And I think it's it's like getting close to the uncanny. So it's something like the clock on the head. I had the exact same experience where I think the first time I ever saw them was at a festival called Bloodlust that used to happen mm. in um, town. And Blackton, yeah. And uh, yeah, and I was I was downstairs in the in the bar. And someone was saying, oh, you got to see this band. The guy comes out with a clock on his head. And everyone <laughs> laughed and went, oh, that's, that's pretty funny. And so we all went up, trooped up to see it. And it was just from the first note, it was like, oh, shit, <laughs> this, is, this is incredible. They were so – I think it, it's not necessarily about being serious, but it is is about having that absolute iron-willed self-belief that this is correct and you can't be shaken, or can't be shaken from it. But they were phenomenal. Well, it's kind, wow. of like, it's kind of like Kane as well. Like, you know, I mean, I'll make this podcast about Kane a little bit, but, you know, okay. when I've seen him live, I mean, the way that he throws himself into his performance and that I, I, whenever I say performance, it sounds like I'm cheapening it, but I mean, it is a performance and yep. he, like, he becomes a different person and, you know, I, I've I've known Kane for a few years, and when he's not on stage, he's like the nicest guy, and he's just so timid and and just yeah. fun to be around. But on stage, you just go, "Oh my god!" Like get out of the way! Like this guy is is an intimidating force, and it's that conviction, yep. it's that sort of just getting up there, going, "I don't give a fuck," and this is this is me, and I'm I'm putting it all on the line. And I think that's that's what separates those bands that you sort of watch and you go oh yeah they weren't bad and the bands that you just go my god they were just fucking incredible yeah oh, the first time we ever saw kane we um we we were over in perth with uh it was just touring i think our second album so we had our vocals at the time jared we, we were actually staying at kane's house um and we were you know we didn't know him all that well he was staying with him and his girlfriend they were really really nice you know we had a barbecue had a, had a good time and we we're talking to um Dizey, you know, Glenn mm -hmm. Dyson, who uh, who was the promoter who took us over there, and he's saying, oh, you got to see Kane's band tomorrow. They're supporting you. you got to see Kane on stage. He's an animal. And we're like, oh, yeah, this guy, he's lovely. <laughs> and then at that gig, so we, I think it was in a, in a skate park or something like that. It was an all-ages gig. It was something where there should have been absolutely no atmosphere. And we, at that time, I guess we felt we were, you know, pretty, pretty good band, pretty good live, you know, a little bit arrogant. Um, so we're over there watching their band going, you know, we'll 
we'll watch this support band and we'll give them a bit of support, you know, all that fucking arrogant garbage. <laughs> and Kane came out and he was just this other person. And I actually remember one thing he said, which at the time I thought was the coolest thing ever. He, he doesn't even remember saying it because I mentioned it to him before. But I remember him coming out with the microphone and he was just kind of muttering to himself into the microphone and there just screams, every dog has its day. And then the song started. <laughs> it was like, what the <laughs> was it was the strangest thing, and he just—he was like a feral, like a feral cat or something. He's got that really sort of animal. So at that point, we were having a little bit of—we had some um, internal issues with Jared, and I remember standing there with with Eric and saying, "If anything happens to Jared, this is the guy we get." And uh, I think you know, probably probably nine months later, um, we, were, we were supposed to go over and tour the US, and and Jared couldn't make it. So it's like, all right, Kane gets the call, and thankfully he could do it because I think he's one of the best front men in the world, if definitely in Australia, but if not the world. Yeah. I think there's, um, there's only a few people that I've seen live over the years where they can just walk out on stage and just, you immediately think that they're going to attack you individually as a person. Like the, it's almost like you could be in a, in a full room, there's a few hundred people in the room or whatever it might be, but you feel like you're the only one in there and they're, they're just going at you. And it is like a really intimidating thing, but that's, 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 the, that's what you want. That's, that's, you want everybody to feel isolated in a way. You want people to feel like they're being uh, sort of acknowledged in, in, in a sense because it's just, oh, it's, a, it's just that conviction thing. I mean, another person who does a really yeah. good job is um, uh, Sam, Sam Dillon from Low, and, yeah. and just another guy who just, when he gets on stage, it just looks like he's going to start a fight with somebody. And, yeah. and just, you just, you feel like hiding behind a pole at the back of the room or something, just, <laughs> just in case, you know, he, he spots you out and, and comes for you. And, yeah. um, yeah, I think I just, I, I wish more, I wish more people were sort of, oh, theatrics is not the right word, but I think, you know, you're obviously, uh, embracing some form of character when you get on stage, you want to, you want to become something, um, where, yeah, yeah so um, it'd be great to see more of that, but, uh, yeah, Kane's just, oh, just, yeah, next level. So yeah, it's, it's cool. Yeah. That, uh, and I think also just watching him in the video clip as well, it's sort of, it's an extension of, of that persona that he's put out there. It's sort of, it just fits in so well with him and it just adds yeah. that extra layer of, or that extra thing to his reputation that he already has. Yeah, definitely. And I think you're right. It's, it's a performance, but I think what makes it work is that it's actually a really natural part of him that's just being, um, it's been isolated and magnified. So it's, it's always in there. Because when, when you know Kane and you see him off stage, as you say, he's so polite and so nice, but there is a manic quality to him. And that's just the aspect of him that just gets amplified. So I think it's, it'd be great if more people can do it, but I don't think it's something you can force. I couldn't do what he does. There's no way in hell. No. I can I can do my own kind of performance, but it's not like what he does. So it's, it's a really odd odd thing i'd just be my my performance would just be me prancing around on stage with a big grin on my face looking like a dickhead like it's <laughs> not intimidating maybe maybe mildly amusing but uh that might be the extent of it <laughs> but that's also that's that's a an embodiment of the music to you as well so that's the fact that it's it's natural and not forced is makes yeah. it correct you know if you were trying to put on something that like if you if you're It'd be different if you were playing in a black metal band. It would possibly wouldn't work, but because it's because it's the Lord music, it's like it feels right. Yeah, I think it's a, it, it's about it's a, once again it's about conviction and honesty. You're doing something that's kind of natural and correct, so it works. Very true, very true. I'll remember that next time I I yeah. prance around on stage and I go, oh, probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> 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 With um. With all the, the social media stuff, um, you know, as, as you mentioned before, you know, just uh, dusting off the Facebook page after five years and seeing whether it still all works, w w in the back of your mind, because you don't have a lot of a, you don't have much of an online presence yourself. I mean, you're somebody no, no. that's, you know, I, I, I'm making a big assumption here, but uh, quite a private person um, and not really overly... Uh, excited about putting yourself out there individually on, on social media, but for you sort of, you know, tackling, you know, the band and putting, putting all this back out and sort of getting a bit of hype going, what, 
did you have anything in mind when you start, started to sort of kick back into this to start posting things and getting people's attention? Was there, was there not so much a strategy, but did you have thoughts about how you were going to approach it and how to get people sort of, you know, engaged in, in what was, what was going to happen? Well, I think one thing that uh, I wanted to do was, was actually inspired by listening to you on a podcast with um, Matt Bacon and, um, sorry, I've forgotten his, the other guy's name, but oh, the Curtis, Dumb and Dumb. Curtis Dewar, yep. Curtis, Curtis, yep. And you mentioned it, how you, the way you speak with fans and it's really personable and you're kind of constantly talking to them. And I was thinking about that and thinking about, uh, in particular, about uh, black metal in the sort of early 90s where it was a lot about letter writing and it was a really sort of personal way of talking to people. And so I, I thought, well, I'm definitely not into social media and I'm not really in any way a kind of social person. I'd rather, if, given the choice of having a conversation and sitting at home with a book, I'd probably take sitting at home with a book. Um <laughs> Yeah, present company accepted, obviously. Thanks, mate. <laughs> yeah. But I, getting into that, I was thinking about what I would like as a fan and what I think is kind of cool about extreme music, which is that outside, I mean, I, I, like all, probably all Australians, I have a bit of a, a problem with the cheesiness of the terms, but that whole thing of like a scene and the, um, you know, a community and all that sort of stuff, I wanted to see if there was a way to uh, keep the, mis the mystery of the band and that kind of um, s that slight remove, but still be really sort of open and authentic and friendly with people. Because I think if I was if I was young and I wrote to a band that I liked and said, "Hey, I really dig your album," and they wrote back and said, "Thank you," that would mean a lot to me. And I think, you know, I'm not um, I'm not like I was when I'm 20. I'm not standing here in corpse paint in a forest pretending I'm some evil spirit. I'm <laughs> you know, just a musician, I'm just a guy. So it's kind of, it's, I think, much nicer to um, to talk with people and, and if they have a genuine, generous response, give them a generous response back and that's how communities are built and, and you have a nice conversation with people. And from, for us kind of coming back after so long, not knowing if anyone still cared, to be honest, it's probably a good way of us making, feeling our, feeling a little bit better about ourselves and saying, you know, hey, that people still care and they're, they're giving us this positive feedback and, and there's all that sort of side as well. But I, I was really conscious that I wanted to, um, to to build something that's organic as opposed to just pushing out posts and going, here's, here's a bit of information about us and then backing off. I don't think that – I don't think the internet is like that anymore. I think you could do that probably in 2005 where you could post something and people would pick it and run with it and it would turn up in forums and things. I think you need to engage now and you need to be talking to people and you need to constantly be letting information come out and you need to um, – I, I think – there's a, a inspiration that happens in between people and bands. And I think if you're inspiring people and they come back to you and one of the things I've been doing is, is uh, putting together a Spotify playlist of shit that we've been listening to and that we find really inspiring. And one of the coolest things is when people listen to it and go, I love this band. Have you heard this band? And they'll, they'll tell you about stuff. And so I guess this is actually how other people use social media and I'm just weird and just finding this out, but it's, <laughs> it's actually been really, really cool. It, I mean, I think it, it there's there's pros and cons to it because, you know, I sort of reflect back, you know, whatever it was, 10, 10 or 15 years ago. And as you said, like you could, you could post something and then there'd be, there wasn't as much noise to cut through. So it was easier for things to be picked up and, and spread across, you know, the, the air quotes community. And so people would know about it, whether it be a show or a release or whatever it is. And I think bands have just got to put that much more effort into, into what they do to cut through that noise just so they can get the attention that they that they deserve. Um, yeah. And I mean, the pessimistic side of me, so the glass half empty side sort of goes, well, that sucks. You know, that sucks that you have to go to the lengths that you do. But then the other side of me sort of looks at it and goes, man, it's just, I kind of wish that bands did more of that back when they didn't have to, because mm. I think they probably would have built a lot more loyalty and probably would have got ahead of the game a lot, a lot sooner than, rather than sort of just falling into the expectations or the requirements now of what, what social media is. But it's a, it's a tough thing to do. And I mean, it's surprising for me to even to hear you say that. So thanks, for, thanks for taking a bit of <laughs> inspiration from that podcast. But, um, you know, for a band like you guys who have a certain image and a certain reputation and just coming from that extreme metal world, it's just it's interesting to hear you say that because I guess if you're going to just 
just throw a very sort of wide range stereotype over over sort of extreme metal it seems like it's something that an extreme metal band wouldn't do and it's better to be aloof and sort of just post something and then just you know if people don't if people don't see it then it's their problem you know that kind of stuff um, yeah and to be interactive and engaging and and to do it from the band account as well is just I, like i think it's refreshing i think it's i don't think a lot of bands are doing what what you're doing as well i think you you sort of taken a concept and you've done it in your own unique way compared to you know even like what i do like yeah okay i use the band account but um a lot of it's coming from my own personal account so i'm sort of using my own name and identity to sort of run alongside the band which is you know one approach but i think what you're doing makes it unique and fresh again so it's kind of cool well i'm glad you glad to hear you say so it's definitely um i think one one thing that I was thinking about when doing it is that it should be everything, everything should be honest and you've got to feel like you're doing it for the right reasons. You've got to feel like it's an authentic thing and it wouldn't be now. It wouldn't be authentic for me to do that aloof thing. Mm. I'm, I'm a music fan and like everyone is, I just want to kind of really fundamentally, all I want to do is talk about music and hear about cool things and chat with people and go, isn't that cool? Uh, the fact that I'm antisocial makes things slightly difficult, but <laughs> I like, I think it would nowadays it would just feel incorrect to do that and i'm too old too old to do that sort of stuff i don't care if uh you know the the truer end of the the metal spectrum go oh that's that's too much it's like this is this is honest all of it's honest this whole album is kind of built around this idea of we're just going to do what we think is correct and it doesn't matter if no one else cares because we think it's correct so that's that's kind of the underpinning all this is this is trying to be while still maintaining that um not mystery but they're the the magic, I guess, of extreme metal, which is a little bit aloof. I think he can do that while still being personally approachable. I think there's a difference between the person and the performance, and I think people are aware of that enough. No one expects to speak to um, a black metal band getting off stage and, and having to you know, dodge the cat blood. <laughs> they're, they're just normal drunken idiots, and I think you'd be surprised if they weren't, but it doesn't stop there being the magic on stage when it works. So I think you can you can still be really personal and you can still speak with people and be really polite and pleasant while still creating music that terrifies mothers. <laughs> oh, I just I think you I think you just got a good blend, especially sort of I think, you know, the guys have obviously got everyone's an individual, you know, individual personalities, but um I think just the way that sort of using the band as a voice um to interact, I think that's just I, it's it's probably a a really healthy balance between sort of that whole mystique around around the band um, and mm. whether it's intentional or not, and then but also being approachable and being able to engage with people and and giving them that little bit of a, a rise, like when you know they get a thank you back or you know a response back from from the mentor. It's like oh wow, you know this is this is cool. I can't believe they responded. Uh, so it and it's the same with me. Like I mean the. The only reason I've I sort of have done any any of this sort of stuff over the years is like I just I just remember how fucking stoked I was when I'd get you know an email back from somebody or or a fucking yeah. letter or, or whatever it was or even at a gig and I'd be like this this fucking loser of a kid like barely can sneak, <laughs> like just sneaking into a gig I I'm still learning at, like to drink alcohol and I walk up to this big burly looking scary looking black metal dude and I go, Oh hi, you know, my name's my name's yeah. Andy. Oh, you really you guys are really good tonight and they're just waiting to be king hit or something like that. They turn around and go, Oh thanks mate. And you go, Oh yeah, thanks so much. Like, yeah. And they're like, Oh my God, they they said they said thank you. Oh, that's amazing. So those I mean I just I always try to like I love that feeling. I love I and I, I try to get that feeling as much as I can myself. And so I think well the only way I can sort of not guarantee it, but in, increase the the likelihood of that happening is for me to put it out there myself, and yeah, and it's it's great. It's a lot of fun because you just you know you find all these different ways to 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 surprise people and just do you know at least from my end I can so I probably get a little bit more flexibility because I can be a bit stupid about it as well and 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 take the piss and do do some silly things along the way and that sort of surprises people as well. But um, yeah, but yeah, it, I think it I think it's definitely something that you. I don't think bands have to do it, but I think it, it certainly gives you an edge and gives you a point of difference. Yeah, yeah. It's a strange thing that social media. Oh well, and and who knows what what the future is going to bring bring as well? Because you know it's 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 a different world now to what it was even a year ago, and 
I mean, one thing with you guys putting out this album in, when's it come out in Feb? Feb yeah, February 19th. 19th, yeah. So, you know, we're in 2021 now and you've had, you know, we're coming on, well, getting closer to 12 months of, of sort of this global pandemic and bands sort of all trying to work out how to adjust and, and, you know, learn to live with what's going on in the world. And I mean, I'm just, I'm throwing money on the table. I'm pretty sure that uh, we're going to be absolutely inundated with, with new music this year. I think there's going to be a lot of bands that have spent last year uh, tinkering away in the workshop Definitely. and they're going to be putting stuff out this year. And I think what bands are going to have to do to try and cut through that noise and get the attention of, of even their own existing audiences, it's going to be interesting because I, I just, yeah, I don't know. I think just it's going to be it's going to be busier than ever. So I'd be interested to see. I mean, have you guys even thought about that sort of stuff with the album coming out? Obviously, you've got a label who's probably making a lot of those considerations themselves. But have you thought about how it's going to sit and and sort of the reaction from, I guess, I don't know the the even just the extreme metal community. Yeah, well, it's in some ways it's a concern because you know, in the old days we we're reasonably confident we could release an album; it'll get reviewed in all these sort of publications we'll get the interviews all that sort of stuff but the more obviously the, the the more stuff going on the the less room there is and things like that and we we've been a long way away so it was kind of you know i don't know how much sway we'll have all that sort of stuff but it's also i think it'll force bands to do interesting things to adapt and it's definitely already it's changed the way we're um looking at working so after that that first film clip came out and the um that seemed to be the way people seem to generally hear the song the most was on youtube which is a really new thing for us and so now we're looking at ways to again potentially use youtube to um to push it a little bit more in ways that we wouldn't have if we were playing live and um if there was if it was sort of a normal time so maybe that's a place where we can try and find a niche that we can push we can do a little bit more in the way of videos we can uh we've got i think we might have got rid of a lot of our um archive stuff now it might be already up there but there's there's still a few live shows and things like that that we can put up and just find a way to kind of engage that community because it does seem to be the audio visual side is where people are really um, that's really growing. So I think if you can if you can find something like that and and work that really hard, then maybe that's going to help stand out. I mean I don't know. I think it's going to be a case of just go and see what happens and then adapt and and try some different things, which is kind of exciting in some ways. It'll it'll force us to do things we wouldn't normally do, and we're kind of in the past have been a kind of a with that whole mystery thing, it's kind of you go out, you play live, don't really do much outside of that. We, you know, I think in the past we've only had one film clip per album. This one we're talking about substantially more than that. So it's it's already changing the way we're working, which could be very exciting, could be interesting. Yeah, I th I, th I love I love the experimentation of of just trying to. It's a bit of trial and error. You go, oh well, is this going to work? You know, does it hit or or not? And and do you usually learn something even if it doesn't hit? Um, and just, I guess, it can be a bad thing as well, but just the rapid pace of, of just the way that music's digested these days. It's just so much stuff comes out, and as soon as it's been out, it becomes old really quickly as well. So you, yeah. you know, one thing in the back of my head that I'm still trying to get better at is how do you continue to repurpose what you've already got out there to make it fresh and exciting for people? How do you how do you do it in a way that doesn't seem like you're, you're cheapening or taking advantage of people either? So it's not like a... You know, back in the day where you'd have an album from like a legacy band and they, they re-release it with an extra bonus track or something like that. Yeah. And and everyone that's the only way you can get is to buy the CD or the vinyl. And it's like, oh, come on, guys, I already own the album. But now I have to go and buy it because I'm, I want the extra track or whatever it is. But, yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, just trying to find a way to, to give what you have, you know, uh, continue to keep it fresh and alive and just moving because... Uh, I guess the assuring thing with it, and it's very much so for us, like after our albums, album cycle, uh, not last year, now it's fucking 2021 now, 2019, um, after that, I found that I had to really go grassroots with the way that I um, continue to, to keep the momentum going with the band where I'm trying to, like, I'm doing a lot more direct messaging with people, I'm, I'm approaching... Um, smaller web zines and blogs just to pass yep. digital copies of the album. I'm trying to be a lot more personable with people just in the hope that somebody, even if they've got a very small audience, will then go and review the album, even though it's now a little bit dated. And some yep. of that works, but it's a lot more, it's a lot more sort of grit and, and manpower you got to put into it to, to sort of keep that sort of needle moving. 
So yeah. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens with, uh, with just sort of keeping stuff fresh and keep it moving. But I think the visual thing's definitely a massive, a massive, uh, opportunity there. And I think with the way that you guys have done that video clip, um, even if you sort of half keep on theme with, with just some of the, some of that sort of visual sort of shocking or just the engagement of, of, of what it is visually, I think, uh, you'll, you'll definitely sort of be able to ride, ride that wave. Yeah, I hope so. I think, uh, that's that's hopefully the key is you kind of as you say albums disappear you release something and you've got a a little window and then it's gone but if you can keep sort of representing it in a way that offers something new like a film clip then hopefully that keeps drawing people back and they listen to it again and then it builds that a little bit of that that breadth because otherwise if you can just sink it's crazy trial and error mate trial and error yep <laughs> <It's a secret. laughs> well so the album's out uh the 19th of feb yep Yep. Rev Revelator and uh, congrats on just making it happen. It sounds like, you know, at least, I mean, as, I mean, you sort of explained it already, but it kind of seems that at times it's a bit of sort of a blood getting blood out of a stone. i um, just given the, the, the length of time that it's taken to, to get it out. So, um, you know, it seems like you, you guys were, were pretty amused along the way and kept yourselves uh, occupied, but um, it must, it must feel good to sort of get to the tail end of this whole process and sort of get to a point now where, you know, just over a month away, you can sort of watch it get released publicly and sort of let it, let it exist. Yeah, I, I'm really excited for it to be out because it is such a, a different album for us, and I think it's going to um, going to surprise some people, which will be cool. It's exciting to see how it all goes down. I have no idea how it'll be received. It'll be interesting. Can't wait to hear it. All right, mate. Well, uh, I'll chuck some links in, and uh, can people pre-order? Oh, they, yeah, they can pre-order uh, the album now, can't they? Yeah, yeah, they can through. Um, Bandcamp, uh, there's EV, uh, EVP's got a store also through Direct Merch and um, uh, DMP's got their Euro and US stores as well. Excellent. Well, I'll dump links in so people can go and pre-order and I'll chuck the video clip in the show notes so people can go and check that out and all, all that stuff. But um, Tim, great to connect. Great to chat. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much, man. Okay, guys, go and pre-order the new album, Revelator, out on the 19th of February through Bandcamp. That's amenta1.bandcamp.com, the number one. And uh, the guys are also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I will have everything in the show notes, of course, uh, over at andysocial.net and andydowling.net. And wherever the hell you're listening to this through right now, you should be able to click through on your little podcast player, click into the description. There should be a bunch of bunch of links in there. Stab your little sausage fingers against the screen and you should be able to go and say hi to Tim and the guys and pre-order the new album. I'll also have a link um, and a video embedded in the show notes over at andysocial.net for seeing money. So go and check that out. Highly, highly, highly recommended. Even if you're not an extreme metal fan, definitely give it a shot because uh, it's uh, it's top notch. It's it's just, it's fantastic. So go and, go and check all that out and uh, very exciting to see one of our iconic extreme metal bands in Australia uh, being reawakened and coming back with a vengeance. Uh, very exciting stuff. So very cool. So get behind that, support the guys, and uh, here we go, 2021. Lots of metal to come. So before we wrap it up, of course, Patreon, patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. The best way to support this podcast, in addition to, of course, listening and sharing the podcast around, subscribing and following, blah, blah, blah. You know the drill. But uh, Patreon has been absolutely massive, and it is the reason why this podcast has now gone to two episodes per week. It's because of these legends, these people that are jumping onto Patreon and supporting the podcast and supports us from only a buck a month. It's dirt cheap, set and forget. It's just, it's, it's nothing. But when a lot of you guys sign up and you all do the dollar, dollar pledge thing or whatever the hell it's called, it's, it's huge. It's absolutely fantastic. And there's a bunch of you that are on there so far. And um, because it's sort of early days in 2021, I wanted to just do a little thank you to everybody because this is the, the next chapter of Andy Social. We are going to two episodes a week, and I just want to say thank you to everybody. You, normally, I just uh, thank some of the guys in the higher tiers, but I want to thank everybody that's got behind me on Patreon so far. So as of the time of recording this outro, of course, because there might be a few extra people that have jumped on since then, but uh, thank you in particular to... <clears throat> Ryan from Adelaide, Andrew from Perth, Mick G from Sydney, Ash from Daniloquin, Dan from Dapto, Riley from Sydney, the Toe Hider guys from Melbourne, Lords of the Trident from Madison, Wisconsin, Sean from Oregon, Johnny from South Australia, Zach from Adelaide, Rod from Ray Lee in North Carolina, Matt from Adelaide, Saul from Oxford in the UK, Patrick from Canberra, Liam from Brisbane, Tom from Melbourne, Chris from Sydney, Frank from Gruppenbach in Germany, Lewis from Early Beach, Turner from Armadale, Samantha from Sydney, Brendo from Leeton, Tim from Canberra, James from Brisbane, Bradley from Canberra, Sean from Melbourne, Kurt from Brisbane, Jason from Adelaide, Christian from Canberra, Cole from Port Kembla, and Jordan from Bendigo. Thank you so much, guys. 
You guys are the reason why the podcast is doing what it's doing right now, and I'm extremely excited for 2021. A hell of a lot of episodes being recorded at the moment, and I'm just so, so excited to highlight amazing people, not only that I find interesting out there in the wide world, but uh, also Australian musicians in particular. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to highlight some of the great music that's uh, happening in our neck of the woods. So strap yourselves in, guys. Looking forward to it. Uh, Next week's episode, no freaking idea. I've got a mix mash of uh, recordings all done and I'm just going to draw a name out of the hat. So until then, take care, folks, and ta-ta. Ta-ta.